Welcome back to MetaRick, where we talk about the blockchain, artificial intelligence, and the metaverse, and all sorts of emerging technologies coming in this next wave of the digital revolution. Um, today, I am so excited to be talking with Tyler Gillespie of Accenture and their Metaverse Continuum Group. Um, he's a long-term creative. He's founded his own agency in the past and is now one of the kind of leading experts on this next era of Metaverse. And so very excited to hear about your story and uh, chat about some ideas of what's been going on lately. Love it. Glad to be here, man. So Tyler, maybe to kick things off, if you want to share just a little bit about your background, like where, where, where did you start your career and how did you end up in this new space of the Metaverse? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, Tyler Gillespie went to, grew up a, um, grew up in a house um, with a dad who um, taught <clears throat> English literature. He also taught speech and debate, um, theology, very much so into philosophy. And my mom, um, who was an artist and a teacher and sort of every other thing in between. And so grew up in a household that was very focused on on the arts. Um, and, you know, not to sound too ethereal here, but very much so just like the just core human experience. Um, grew up in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, nothing, you know, didn't grow up wealthy, didn't grow up super poor. Um, just, you know, grew up. And I think with that instilled in me a, a really strong um, desire to always look for other things, look for new things. Um, I grew up in a house where at the time, faith was a large part of my household. That is no longer the case. And so the idea that you're constantly searching for, and that in that case answers, but um, searching and digging and sort of, and I remember at a very young age, thinking, boy, I'm having some pretty interesting existential conversations with my <laughs> parents. Um, I mean, as existential as you could probably be, you know, as a teenage boy. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I um, was grateful that it was a household f full of art and, and music um, and tchotchkes. And if you can see all the stuff behind me, you can see where I get it honestly. Um, and so I ended up going to uh, NC State. Um, swam there for my freshman year um, academics were not something that I was necessarily um, focused on is probably the right word I, um, I just like enjoyed even like in high school I don't even remember focusing on I, I, mean, I did well I think I had like straight A's and took AP classes and all that but like I probably think the reason I got through that was because of, I had like really nice connections with my teachers and the people around me and um, I was student body president, so like that's what the things I was focusing on, and like playing sports, and just again the human experience. Not, <clears throat> I had zero business acumen. Um, I love my parents to death. They have zero business acumen. You know, they just they're about exploring the simpler things in life. <clears throat> and then I remember I went to college, um, which changed some ideals in me. <laughs> um, and quickly, I actually went in as a marketing major I, I think like I gotta be honest I don't even really remember um, and this long story is gonna lead to a really good ending so I just wanted you to, to be prepared for that oh I'm ready <laughs> um, for it so and I remember being in like different marketing classes I'm talking like macro and microeconomics as a freshman in college and I was like the only thing I really cared about was the band that I was playing in you know swimming for NC State and my fun extracurriculars and um I remember being in the class and being like, I got like a paperback, I got like a D or something. And I was like, oh, I don't know this and I don't care. <laughs> like, in, <laughs> it was one of those challenging times where I thought, uh oh, I think I'm supposed to care about things like finance and how business works. And I just don't. And I'm not good at it. And it was one of the first times in my life. This sounds arrogant. I don't intend it to, but I was like, shit, I'm not good at this. <clears throat> I fortunately was also in like a film elective class and was like really, really, really 
into that class. I was very passionate about it. I loved the teacher. His name was Tom Wells, I think is his name. Anyway, amazing program there. And I ended up, he talked to me one day. He's like, have you ever thought about majoring in film? And I went, nope. Didn't even know you could do that. And then I remember, because I don't know any better, just like, yeah, I switched my major. And I remember calling my dad. Or I sent him an email and I was like, hey, I'm switching my major from um, business to film. And the response that came back was, hey, I think the guy who served me ice cream this morning at Baskin Robbins had a film degree as well. And I know that there was <laughs> you know, jokes on him now. Um, I know that he was being facetious and, and funny, but I mean, at the same time, I was like, wow, what the hell are you going to do with a film degree? And I wasn't thinking about that. I had, I was like, I don't know. All I know is I enjoy studying this a lot more, and I feel like I'm, um, <clears throat> I'm feeling like, you know, the arts are calling me. I feel like it's always been a part of my life. You know, design was a big part of my life growing up. I was did art class and AP art class and independent study, and because I was swimming, um, I was reticent to try to get into the design program at NC State just because of the the hours and. and requirements to be in studio and all that and so I was a film major and absolutely loved it um got to explore the way people thought about story making narrative development um technology I mean you want to talk about an industry that has been rooted in some of the most forward-facing technologies it's film it's um, it's, it's really interesting that that piece of your background because this is something I um I recorded an episode with Nate Essen the other day who actually introduced us funny enough. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's the one who brought this up. He, he was like, it's so funny that you, me and Nate all come from a film background. Yeah. Like that's where all of us started. And mm -hmm. filmmaking is such an interesting art form because it, it it's, it's creative and it's storytelling. Like the end result is this moving picture, right? The, the combination of sounds and visuals to tell a story. Mm -hmm. But the process in which you get to that end result is so different than than painting or, or yep. making music or other things because it combines all of it. You need people that understand lighting and colors. You need people that understand composition. And they're, they're different people with different tools to master each of those pieces of the puzzle. And then you need both a business person in that producer type role and then also a visionary creative in that director type role to help organize all those skills and all those little pieces of technology yeah. to get to that end result. And that's not even mentioning the whole post-production process after, right? And it's, I, I've found as I pivoted from film into business, there is a lot of parallels between running a film set and producing a movie and running a team in a company and working with marketers and creatives, like not just on producing their content, but literally just on working with them on campaigns. Mm -hmm. So I wonder like what that pivot was like for you out of film into business and like did, <laughs> how, how it film might've helped benefit you on that transition. Oh, good, good news for you for having that um, maturity level. I obviously, I mean, hindsight being what it is, that's, I, I, I would love to frame it that way, but I was just like, oh, this is fun. I'm, critiquing films and learning about storytelling so <clears throat> after college they were like what are you gonna do f for a living and i was like what don't like, i don't know i've had like an internship at a film studio i am i guess they give me a job and they're like oh, it doesn't just happen like that anyway this is like <clears throat> i'm not gonna say it's embarrassing but like i'm really showing my head I, I had just no idea what i was doing and so i ended up moving down to atlanta um, because I had well, the cool thing that NC State had opened up a sort of design career a design um, craft path for film students so you had to apply to it and have a portfolio and say I'm interested like I have a design background and I would like to integrate that into my film major and so I was able to do that and so I got I, I got to work with some just brilliant design professors um, at NC State, they really instilled in me the the notion of just enough and no more. It was a very minimalist design program that was that was there. The architecture school, obviously, being based on that, um, and that what I started to realize is, oh, there's some fascinating connections between engineering, industrial design, film, graphic design, animation, storytelling, and so I really started to explore. You know what could it be like so i thought about getting my master's at nyu in documentary filmmaking i was a huge major 
major fan of uh, documentaries, being able to tell the human story, but doing it in a creative ways. Um, documentaries are blind. so, so cool. Sorry, I just want to double click on that for a second. Um, I had a buddy when I was in film school that did his first documentary. The, the documentary film teacher was this crazy dude. Mm -hmm. Like, I forget his name, but he was an absolute character. And my buddy ended up making a documentary about Slab City. I don't know if you're familiar with it, yeah, but it's oh, yeah. like this little outcast community um, yeah. kind of down here in Southern California. And they've got basically no rules. It's all these people come out there and just kind of set their own little civilization in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And he went and explored and interviewed these people and learned about their lives. And it was such a different form of storytelling than we'd ever done before. Cause we were used to like music videos and narrative storytelling. Yeah, right. What, so what was like one of your first documentary projects and like what, what drew you to that as like a particular style? Well, <clears throat> I ended up not falling through with it <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, for, for a myriad of reasons. One, I was in a band and then at the time I thought, this is it. This is what I'm doing for my career. Um, but I, I started to work on a, oh my gosh, this is funny. I'm just remembering this now. I lived in Raleigh, North Carolina and went to NC State at sort of the hype of the new age hipster fixed bike. Mm, trend. I was I was on that trend. I rode a fixie for like three years. <laughs> oh yeah, and so I mean I was in it hard. Um, and so I th think the first documentary I started working on was one called "Is This Shit Fixed?" <laughs> it was about a, uh, That's clever. It was about the fixie culture and stuff like that. I mean, what year? What wasn't there a movie about this with um, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt? He was like a bike messenger. Oh yeah. And they shoot those like like almost spy movie type little cuts where he's like mess he's delivering like a package on his bike in like yeah, New York I think City. Ray Liotta is like chasing him or something. And he's like yeah, looking he's like, around, yeah, like, seeing where the taxi is about to crash, and like yeah. all the all the routes he can take on his fixie. But no yeah, brakes, he can't funny. stop. <laughs> I do, I do remember that film. Yeah. Um. So yeah, just was really into that, and then uh, the NYU thing for I don't remember that was so long ago, but like didn't go through and I was like I'm gonna go apply to Pixar and that didn't work because um, I wanted to be an animator anyway <clears throat> moved down to Atlanta worked for a film house there and really started to get a good taste of when a client would come into a film house and say I'm looking to do X how you responded to that and all it was one of my first times seeing b business in action where I was going oh they're addressing pain points or, and it's not like, Hey, I want a cute video. It was like a, Hey, I'm trying to tell a story about this. And I remember working with the executive producer in, and learning a lot from them. Um, I, I was an editor and motion graphics artist there. And that's when I really fell in love with narrative structure and storytelling at being an editor. Um, fast forward, worked for some agencies, um, had my own, um, sort of brand going at the time called Mad Hatter design company. Um, used that as a moniker for a lot of my freelance work. Um, really got heavy, heavy, heavy into brand design. So did a lot of branding work, visual identity work, uh, marketing campaign work. Um, then I started to get really tired of just being like contract to contract or job to job. And I remember thinking, man, I have a real um, affinity for for strategy, but I don't know it but that makes me mad that no one's giving me a chance. <clears throat> and so, because I'd go into meetings and then they'd be like, you don't have the background for this role, you don't have the, the credentials or whatever, like we like the way you talk about it. Um, and what I started to realize is, oh my gosh, there is a massive lack of business acumen represented in the creative workforce for, for a myriad of reasons. I don't think it's a fault, but that's just truth. And that is why creatives oftentimes are not brought to the table when it's time to make decisions or help mitigate risk or identify opportunity. So I took a hard pivot and said, I really need to go focus on business and growing my business acumen and keep, you know, keep this absolute love for the human experience and creation of experience and visual identity and sound design. Cause I was in a band and at one point I was trying to be a music <clears throat> supervisor for films. <clears throat> anyway, all this to say, what this has all led to is 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 I have such an acute belief 
that my reason for being here in this human form is to create better experiences for people to um and i don't even want to say advanced experiences it's like continue to carry on the experience of curiosity surprise delight entice and and however i might be able to do that so i was fortunate that um when we moved to Houston, I really leaned into sort of my own firm idea and really opened up my own company called Mad Hatter, Mad Hatter Coalition. We were focused primarily in the venture capital market um, as a venture studio, really helping um, venture capitalists, whether they're angel investors or like VC houses, um, think about their portfolio, their strategy. Um, that introduced me to a certain level of financial acumen that I had not had before. Um, risk mitigation, how, how to build a product strategy, um, things like IBM's design thinking methodologies, IDEO, how do you solve the right problem better. <clears throat> Through that, I ended up starting to realize, man, this is owning your own company is not, is tough. I had just had my twin daughters and I had an opportunity to go work for ExxonMobil. And at first I was like, yeah, right, dude. Like, that could not be a bigger pendulum swing for me. And then I really started talking to some folks and said, wow, this is an opportunity to really grow my corporate acumen, my business. And I want to go see. I want to go see what a company of this magnitude um, is like to work for. And I, I think this is going to help me grow. So I did that, and it was a beautiful experience. Um, well, and that's a, that's a huge change, right? Like going from owning, being your own boss, managing your own work, um, and, and being able to, I mean, there's a lot of stress that comes with that, right? Like, it's not like it's all sunshine, sunshine, sunshine and rainbows, but that's a pretty, mostly not sunshine and rainbows. Yeah. It's, it's hectic. It's hard. Um, and, and I'm, I'm wondering like in that role with Exxon, like what was the role that, that, that attracted you to come over? Like, like what were they bringing you on to do for, for them? So I was very fortunate that Exxon Mobil had really leaned into design thinking. Um, and there was a team that existed within their IT organization that was basically an internal consultancy to the entire business. Um, so I went in as a <clears throat> design strategist where I could help people. Um, they said one of the things that was attractive about me is I had zero background in upstream or downstream. quickly um but yeah, it's one of the really, beautiful things about creative by the way is like when when you're a really creative thinker one it's easy for you to learn new things right because you think creatively as it is but the other thing is there's so much overlap right like when i and i was just talking to the this a, small agency called launchbox um, and they're kind of a specialist agency for pushing the boundaries of what you can do with technology mm -hmm. um, at first i thought they were really focused on 3d immersive which which they are but they actually do a lot of stuff with ai and, and other things okay. as well and one of the things that came up in that conversation uh was we were we were talking about this idea that creative work can really breathe across industries so like most of their background was in medical devices um mm -hmm. and creating 3d simulations for medical device tutorials on how to use a product or um, kind of tr training right on these very complex uh, laboratory equipment tools. But that same skill set of building those simulations can translate to cars and automotive. It can translate to IT mm -hmm. and technical solutions with visualizations of data, like, like all of those creative skill sets apply to these other industries. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing you have to learn is like the language right? Like, like, how do you talk to these people? What are those industry right. terms, the little bit of slang that maybe you don't know yet. And then there's some slight nuance in the specialty of like the reflectiveness of a car. If you're doing photo content, for example, like, like that reflection could impact the angle you have to shoot from and things like that, or how you light the, the product. But at the end of the day, you're still a guy taking pictures. You're still using the same tools. It's just the right. nuance to it is slightly different. I like that framing. I can definitely say that the thing that ExxonMobil helped me with most is that, um, and at first it was very frustrating, and I, um, I had some very um, sort of existential and vulnerable conversations that I had to have with people, but at the end of the day, one of the things I realized is, Tyler, you can't go into a company and expect 
to be able to help change them, whether it's their culture, their strategy, if you do not understand their business. And it really opened my eyes to this idea that if you cannot, not just with empathy, but with authority, understand how a business works and all businesses work very differently, how can you expect to impact it? And I remember, and I think it's one of the largest plights of creative agencies is they come in and say, it's a lot of, hey, let me help. I need to force you through the door and it's pushing, it's pushing, it's pushing. And one of the things it takes a lot more maturity, it takes a lot of patience is opening a door for somebody and helping them walk through. <clears throat> that is something I still struggle with today. Um, ExxonMobil though, man, I had some really tough conversations with people where I would just be like, what don't you get about this? Like, well, I am, I'm talking to you about desirability tactics on this new idea that you have. What do you not understand? And then they would be like, what do you, what you don't understand is the way that this business makes money. And if you can't understand that, please do not try to help. And I was like, that's it. That is so, and it was one of the times where I knew, because I had been consulting for a long time, that to go in and to be a hundred miles wide and you know a foot deep is not going to drive impact yeah this so this it was a th this really actually an experience for me yeah that, that understanding of like the, it's it's almost like empathy right and i think this is the direction the business is going more and more is like the way we sell the way that we provide services the way we work together is like it all comes down to empathy how much can you understand the perspective of the other person you're working with or the business that you're working with and that is not always aligned with the KPIs of a service industry. A hundred percent. And and finding a way to match that is difficult. Like like one example when I was in the event space was this idea of ESG um, and talking about how a virtual event can save on all of this carbon emission compared yep. to a physical event. And I put that in my talk track for a while and most people kind of nod their head to it. Like sure. I, it's, it's kind of like, like who's not supportive of saving the environment in some right. way. Like, whether they put their money to it's a different question, but if you talk about it, they're going to nod their head. Yep. But then this one, um, it was somebody at Decker's actually and up in Santa Barbara. He's the only person to ever called out or he was like, well, look, you're right. But the reality is when it comes to ESG and sustainability, if I go to my CEO and I present that as why we should buy a virtual event tool, he's going to show me a pie chart that shows all of the waste that's happening on the, on the logistics and supply chain, on the manufacturing of products. Yep. And then he's going to show me how events is this tiny little yep. sliver of that pie chart. And so it might matter a lot to the person selling it, but it might not matter as much to the company buying it. And there's that need to, to find a balance there. And that's interesting you say that. And, and we, there's actually an example happening right now. And I don't mean, this to take away from any um, pain or frustration that this is called, but Microsoft I think today laid off a lot of folks. I just saw that to you. And there is an article floating around that was like, can you believe that the executives hired Sting to play a show at Davos the day before? That was a, you know, it could have cost them upwards of $500,000 and they let all these people go. Now, not to take away from layoffs being an incredibly um, upending, earth shattering, very, very hard thing for families and people to go through. $500,000 for a musician was not gonna save that team. And, and it's one of those things where it's, it's a hard position to walk, where you need to walk it is this fine line between you have to be able to be incredibly empathetic to the human experience and, and this is a yes and, is have the business acumen to understand why decisions are made. And it is, it puts me in a really tough position a lot of times, especially as a creative. Um, I can tell you that at Accenture, I am, um, I'm not going to say I'm a People oftentimes, I think, consider me to be a cynic or a skeptic. I think that those two things could not be further from the truth. I think what I am is a naturally curious person, and I think that radical candor is important, and I don't give a shit what the company is, 
what the person's job is. I don't care if you're the fucking CEO of Nike or the president of the United States. You're a person. I'm going to talk to you like a person. And by the way, there's obviously like politeness and all those kind of things like tact that go into being a professional. But this idea that uh, you can't ask tough questions and you can't, hey, um, they want a digital world built. Why are you asking them why? I'm like, well, See that? What... Oh my! I'm so glad you said that I'm because like, that's what I'm. If that's not what I'm here to do, then that's I don't know what to tell you. And well... so I think this idea that to say, listen, I will be the first person to be like, let's go off into the desert, eat a bunch of peyote, and come up with game-changing galactic ideas. That is me to the core. I also have enough respect for capitalism <laughs> um, and, and yes. frankly, the way that business works to say this has to connect. Now, if I had my druthers, every human would be able to identify with this galactic consciousness that we all share and work together as one human experience, building cool things together. Like that's, my, that's where I am at in my core. Well, and that's possible. Human experiences in order to enjoy parts of the human experience, business has to function. Like, and it's like last night, my buddy and I sat out behind a fire pit. He is a, um, he maps. Oh gosh. I'm Rob. If you're listening to this, I'm sorry. This is gonna be a terrible representation of what you do, but he builds really, um, visually pleasing maps of subsurface oil wells in order for his company that he works with to understand how most effectively and efficiently to get oil out of rocks in the West Texas basin. Anyway, surface level, I'm like, well, what the hell are you talking about, dude? And then he went through the intricate details of what his job is. He's like, I, focus on a daily basis looking at what the earth looked like 20 million years ago in order to find organic compound that was once people and dinosaurs and plants and plankton that has turned into this <coughs> sludge that we can take out of the ground in order to power our human experience and I was like wow like that was the coolest way to frame that um, and that was another example of so many times where I think especially as a creative, especially as a technologist, someone who works in innovation, you know, whatever <laughs> word you want to put in there, is, man, grounding yourself in, 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 in lifting any preconceived notion about a brand, what you think their mission is. That's, I think, what is so beautiful about our job as consultants. Um, and when we get to dig deep, it's wonderful is to be able to say, what is the reason you do this? I don't care, like political stuff aside, like my personal feelings on fracking, I need to be able to take that out of the picture completely. My personal feelings on like, is drilling for oil a cool industry or, again, I have to be able to remove that similar to what you're talking about with like sustainability is like, it's so easy to look at, to look at the world it's not just easy. It's close to a non-starter, but you have to look at the world through your own experience. And if you aren't willing to take a second to stop and go, I can't think of it this way. Like my, my entire human experience to date has, has led me to believe things X, Y, and Z. In order for me to add impact to this person, this business, I need to shed all of that, close my mouth, listen, learn, and then go back to this, you know, so, so there's a, there's a lot that I have that I can say, okay, well, now that I've learned this about you, I can maybe be able to impact your business. And I think we, we do that on the opposite side. So often we come in and go, I'm here, I'm here to help. Like, so, thank God your super conservative industry has called on Tyler, the magic man, Gillespie, I'm going to change the way you think. And you end up just realizing, man, you've got to just shed that part of you in order to drive impact. 
which is one of the most frustrating things about the metaverse right now is because there's so many preconceived notions about what snake oil is out there, what's not out there, what works, what doesn't. Anyway. So, so I just want to pause you real quick. Cause there's a, there's a lot of gold nuggets in there. Um, and, and I want to, I want to isolate a couple of them. So one of the things that, that stands out to me there is this idea that like any concept can be not boring, right? Like, like yeah. there's a, that, that idea of like talking to your friend on the surface level, this job sounds like something that maybe you wouldn't be that interested in. And then maybe you talk to him and he's, and then you hear about it and you're like, he's really excited about it. He's got a story to tell around it. And then all of a sudden it opens your eyes to something new. Mm-hmm. And most of the best ideas that have ever come from anything. I was just listening to Palmer Lucky, the founder of Oculus talking about this the other day is like having this breadth of knowledge and a lot of different things, like dipping mm-hmm. your hand in all these different cookie jars allows you to have the the information to bring a new idea to a different industry to be able to Mm -hmm. tell a tractor company that i saw a handbag company doing this and it might actually apply to tractors in a new way and And like in order to do anything with that tractor company though you better understand why the tractor company currently does the things that it does who the people are who are working at that tractor company what their experience has been to date a hundred percent. You can start to so, so this, drive impact. This is a, so there's, there's kind of two topics that we're touching on here. One is I think, um, for, for, for listeners out there, it's like, like, I think a lot of people get hung up on, like, you have to be absolutely in love with your job or absolutely in love with the product you sell or whatever it is. I'm a firm believer as a salesperson, especially you have to have some belief in the customers you're helping and the mission that you're on. Otherwise you're not going to do a good job. But what I would challenge people to do is open their minds a little bit to the idea that you could get excited about more things than you might have thought you could. Um, Like you might have a set number of interests in your day to day life, but who knows if you're going to get excited by HR software. Maybe you could is if you take a close enough look at it and kind of unpack the the customer and their experience a little bit deeper, you might be surprised what excites you. Um, There is an amazing artist named Rami. Oh, boy, this is embarrassing and because I'm not saying his last name. And I want to be able to cite him correctly. Um, he does this thing called the um, Rainbow Brain Skull, and it's like power-activated like cards to like talk to you about like just cool things in the universe. He's this brilliant artist, and each card sort of talks about like here's one I just pulled. It says, "There's a lot I have to let go of. Luckily, I can release it all at once. Like if that's not." You know, it's like this really cool artwork oh, that's that comes with it. And and last night I was just reflecting on this. And I saved it and I actually sent it to my team. And it was this art card, this card that said, every timeline exists, choose one to move towards. If you can imagine it, then it exists somewhere in space and time. Like a radio, your brain is a receiver of information. You can tune it into any reality you choose if you're able to align with it. And one of the things that I think I, I see a lot and the thing that I like to mentor and coach my, my peers and, and folks with is your imagination, your curiosity is not um, governed by the thing that you are being imaginative about. It's governed by you. So it is your job to look at something and say, how can I be imaginative about this? And I don't mean innovative. If there's one thing I hate is the way that the word innovation is thrown around to me in literally everything. I mean imaginative. I'm of the opinion that if people had more time for imagination and spent less time worrying about innovation, we'd be in a very different places. (laughs) Well, well, and and that doesn't matter what role you have either. I think creativity is so important. Like, like this is something I've been thinking about a lot the last week or two, um, is that most of my favorite people, uh, like in my friends and most of the really successful people I admire, uh, people like you, people like Nate, people that I want to the reason I even created this podcast to be able to talk to these kind of people. Um, they have this balance between creativity and then like business acumen or like an organization, like more mm-hmm. technical skill set. They, they find a way to do both. Um, one of my best friends is a guy with like 12 guitars and he jams and plays guitar all the time. I worked at Sonos for a while and now runs his own consulting firm and like successfully delivers great marketing results for, for small, medium sized businesses. 
Another guy's a DJ. Wrote Lodgins real fast. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. No worries. No worries. Um, but riffing off of that example you shared, I want to go ahead and shout out something out that I've been waiting for this book for about two months. The boy Rick Rubin. Um, he just launched this book. It's called uh, The Creative Act, A Way of Being. I'm about halfway through it. It's like big words, not a lot of text per page. It's pretty Love easy it. to get through it quick. But it's talking a lot about a lot of the same things that you're describing, where it's like creativity really is about training your antenna to get in tune with the universe and all of the different stimuli. Like when you go on your long walk in the morning, the stuff you see gets associated back to the work you were doing that morning or like the yeah. stuff that the stress you were going through the last week or two in training your antenna to pick up on those stimuli to, to be able to understand how they can provide value to the things that you're creating and to the, the next step of what you want to do. It's like these little signals, like you start yeah. to pick up a pattern where you'll see the same thing in your life five, six, seven times over the course right. of a month. And that's the universe speaking to you somehow and saying that needs, it's time for that to be created. It's time for that to be implemented in your life in one way or another. And, and it's a little, you know, like some people might call it a little hippy dippy or whatever, but like personally, I find that those forces do exist to a certain extent. You have to be open to the world telling you things. And then the business acumen is important because it helps you filter it. Like you have the antenna open to listening and taking that stuff in. But then if you train the business acumen or the more technical side of your yourself, you can filter that information and decide which pieces of it to listen to, which pieces of it to incorporate and how to incorporate it to go build something or go deliver on something. It, it's a balance between that free flowing creativity and then getting stuff done. And so when I talk to salespeople about this and like every BDR I've ever worked with, who's like entry level sales role, trying to figure out their place in this world. I'm like 80% of your time should be standard sequences, cold calling, get stuff done. Like there's a template, there's a standard process that'll help you get to your number and get those meetings, close those deals, whatever it is. But that other 10 to 20% of your time, you should be as creative as possible. Try new stuff, write copy that no one told you to write. Think about a type of persona that no one told you to reach out to and stretch those boundaries. And if you get a team of even as little as 10 people, as many as a couple hundred people, that 10 to 20% of creativity compounds and the best ideas come forward and can get put into that 80% that, to that standard process. But if you don't incorporate a little bit of that creativity, then you're missing out on all these ideas and you just end up doing the same thing that you were doing 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and eventually it doesn't work anymore because life has changed and people are different. That's interesting. I want to... <clears throat> present a semi alternative um, thought on that um, by the way thank you fisherman's friend for sponsoring this podcast today and allowing all of our voices to sound sweet and sultry and without scruffiness um, <clears throat> I've lately been doing a lot of thinking on this I'll say this, I've lately been doing a lot of reflecting on this because I wanted to challenge my own thought on it. I'm at a place now, and as someone who believes greatly in growth mindset, I maybe feel different in a year from now, but right now, if you're talking to me today, I believe <clears throat> that not everyone is creative, and that is okay. Creativity is a manifestation of imagination. So you should have creative people, which by the way is a skill. So a creative person is someone who has, there's obviously some natural talent there, but it's also someone who has honed this craft and they have been able to find out how to take imagination and manifest it visually, through sound, if you're a musician, through whatever medium that takes us, but paint, doesn't matter. One of the things that I want to challenge a lot of people on is like, don't focus on trying to be creative. You just might not be. That's okay. Focus on allowing yourself to sit with your imagination and whatever skill you have, manifest your imagination through that. 
so, one of the so things that I would I want people to say is like I know people who are just dynamite financially minded folks I wouldn't say that that was creative I would say that they have found a way to manifest imagination through numbers not creative well, I, I, so, so, so I have a I have a couple thoughts on this. Um, yeah. The first one is Rick Rubin actually talks about the same thing you just said and just uses no different way. words. Um, so what he uses is he's Good like, <laughs> the, the the difference is he says everyone is creative, but not everyone is an artist, and that's the difference. Is like everyone has the creative right. itch in their mind somewhere, some way. But if you choose to dedicate time and energy to it and channel it, then like, yeah, then you're an artist and you've chosen to be an artist in some way versus choosing to channel that in a different way or not to at all. But the other thought that came to mind when you mentioned the finance thing and that there's other ways to use your imagination, there's a book called, um, Euler's fabulous formula. And I didn't read the whole book. It's like 500 pages. It's one of those books that, you know, I thought was a cool idea and then just kind of set it down. But the idea is very cool. And the idea is that this formula of uh, it's a very famous formula, Euler's formula, um, combines these different mathematical concepts in a way that no one had ever been able to do before and makes a valid equation uh, with like imaginary numbers, one uh, pi, I forget the exact list. But yeah. what this book talks about is it's like that is art. Like that is yeah, a yeah. form of art. The language of the art form is equations and mathematics versus yeah. paints and colors. The medium of the art form is different. Yeah, that's cool. <clears throat> I dig that a lot. And that's, that's something that I've sort of to go back to that because, you know, where I work currently in my day-to-day -day job, my day-to-day -day role is to, is to help bring that God, this is like such a lame corporate term but like 360 omnipotent viewpoint to, to solving problems and I'm saying not that I do that but like I provide I think a lens and then the important part is to have um, a lot of lenses and I think that that is <coughs> It's one of the beautiful things about working for a large company where you have the resources to be able to do that. Um, well, let's, let's dive into that a little bit. Um, cause I, I don't, don't worry. I love these, uh, by the way, I think I accidentally turned my gain up a little bit. Um, I, I think that these conversations are amazing. I love talking about creative and like the, all of the ways in which we can come up with ideas. I could talk about this stuff for hours. Um, and I loved your, and now, or your story about being around the fire doing it. Cause I think there's something so primal around fire and like looking at fire and conversations around a fire. I think there's something really special about that. Um, but I am also very excited about the work that you do, um, and the stuff that you're doing today. And so what, what exactly is your role with Accenture and the metaverse continuum group? I'm not sure how many listeners are going to be familiar with the group in general. So maybe a high level of, of kind of Accenture's direction of what you can share there and then yeah. your piece of that puzzle. Yeah. So Accenture and what I've also learned is some people don't know what that is. So Accenture is right now, um, the world's largest technology service company and consulting company. It has grown just massively. I think it's 739,000 employees the last time I looked, which is just asinine. Um, <clears throat> and just filled with brilliant people. Um, it has, I think, the world's largest creative agency or advertising agency, whatever uh, nomenclature they use there, huge strategy and consulting arm, a massive technology group. That's sort of where we're sort of rooted in. And um, one of the big sort of strategic um, tent poles that Accenture puts into the marketplace is a um, a white paper, for lack of a better term, called the Fjord Trends, and that was based on Fjord, the interactive, the giant interactive agency that we acquired. This has recently been renamed or rebranded to Life Trends, um, and so listeners, feel free to go look that up. <laughs> um, and I highly recommend it, by the way. Um, I mean, I've I follow. I think it's, it's Tom um, Fisk is on the Accenture Thought Leadership Group, and I've seen him share a bunch of the little like summed up points that have come from that report, and it's it's really valuable. Definitely yeah, recommend there's it. Some, there's a lot of good thoughtful stuff in there. If I was to tell the listeners anything, 
This is Accenture's point of view. Do not read it as gospel. Yeah, yeah, fair. <laughs> and the reason I'm saying that might not sound apparent, but it is, it's very easy for a company with the equity and size that Accenture has to put something into the marketplace and that becomes some sort of like written law. That's not, the, this, is, this is our point of view on interesting market trends, interesting behaviors, and interesting design and technology trends. So a couple years ago, um, when the sort of beginning rumblings of, I can't even stand the word anymore, but the metaverse started coming up and, and, and what that is and is it different than Web3 and is Web3 different than Web3.0? You know, all these kind of conversations that was started. One of the things that I was super impressed with is Accenture took their technology incubation group and um, Song, so Accenture Song is the large, the massive creative house of Accenture. And they had two absolutely brilliant humans, uh, David Treat and Mark Curtis, exec oh, and David Droga, who is the CEO of Droga5, one of the you know, most creative agencies in the world, sponsored this idea that, and by the way, this was a go big or go home move, I might add, and it was actually what brought me over to Accenture is I was so um, flabbergasted <laughs> by this business decision that I was like, oh, look, if you're willing to like, bring me in to watch, let me watch this happen, I am, I'm here for it. Like, it's a social experiment on my own. Um, they said, hey, every, every single business and person will be impacted by the metaverse. And I went, oh my God, what? That is a huge claim to make. And so they were like, we're going to put our money where our mouth is, and we are going to build the world's largest metaverse service team. And I'm listening to this thinking, you have got to be kidding me. This is a technological theory and now you're saying we need to go make offerings and go to market strategies and sell this to you know metaverse as a service as a you know enterprise transfer and i'm going what in the world <clears throat> and so they built this thing <clears throat> excuse me that said we want to come to the market with technology innovation strategy rooted in creativity and help companies understand what the metaverse is, what it's not, and how that's going to impact every aspect of their business and the way they interact with humans. And so that could be employee interactions, that could be you know an employee experience, an industrial experience, a consumer experience. Um, so at the time, interestingly enough, I was working at another technology firm and, and just with a bunch of people that I absolutely love, and I um, happened to meet um, a lovely person named Krista Taylor who was part of the, she was the head of like global extended reality learning. And I was thinking, how was that even a position? So I'm like, okay. And I talked to her and I was just so impressed by this like swing for the fences at a company this size. Um, and at the time I, I was talking to like some folks about maybe becoming an Imagineer because I had just been working with Disney quite a bit as a client and, and it was like a long-term dream of mine. I was thinking about a myriad of other things and I was like, I don't know, guys, if you're willing to have me, like, I'm going to come watch this. And so um, right now, my role is I'm a global experience lead within our go-to-market team for Metaverse Continuum. So my primary job is to work with uh, companies and industries globally to start to talk to them about do they, like, to figure out where their maturity around this, the M word, <laughs> is and what are some of the interesting first steps that you can take to make very practical, pragmatic, um, and viable uh, business decisions that are using certain technologies, applications um, that are sort of rolling up into this idea called the metaverse and what new human behaviors are we seeing or new pain points that are new or old pain points that are existing in businesses or the human condition that we believe some of these technologies could address um, accelerate roadmaps, mitigate risk, mitigate pain point, all that sort of stuff with a massive focus on it being metaverse related. And so it, the cool thing, the, well, the blessing and the curse of the metaverse is everyone has a different definition of it. And it includes like, it's an umbrella term that includes like, frankly, every single technology that's not, you know, Microsoft Word at the point. Like it's, 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 it's almost become a joke to where I could, I could spin any conversation I would want right now into it being a metaverse thing if I was wanting to like build my pipeline. 
I don't do that because I have enough integrity to not do that. However, and it's been very interesting to try to just figure out what do people really think about this. And man, there is a lot of snake oil out there. Oof. Um, now, the cool thing is I think people are learning a lot very quickly. There are social experiments. Like, so, so quick, quick question for you. Yeah, um, so there's a obviously like one of Accenture's roles in this, like to what you described is like defining what it is, what it isn't mm -hmm. like you're, you're helping consult these organizations so that they can avoid the snake oil and do the things that are valuable. And yeah. for every brand, that's a little different, right? Yeah. Like we talked earlier, you have to understand what they actually need before you can yep. advise them on what they should build for you as a, as an advisor for someone who's sitting in that seat, how do you cut through the bullshit? Like with your own research and your understanding, like what's your approach to, to improve your own understanding of the metaverse? So I don't care what your definition of the metaverse is. And I think a lot of people are spending too much time trying to define the metaverse. Um, my goal is to help companies say, here's how it will impact my business. Mm. So like, so we're, we're all getting caught up so much time is being spent caught up on like what is it what is it not is your definite is it the next version of the internet is it the next is it just the experience layer of web there's i mean it's just like guess what that's going to figure itself out more importantly what i talk to our companies about is let's let's unpack this let's not look at like the one of the examples i often use is around legos and so like and a lot of people are out right now trying to sell Lego sets, being like, here's a Metaverse castle or a Megaverse dragon or the Luke Skywalker Red 5 Metaverse Lego helmet. Buy it. My job and what I believe in is say, no, 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 no. I'm going to open up the Lego pack and I'm going to spill all the Legos out on the table. Some of these may be applicable to you. Some of them, guess what? Some of these might be net new technologies. Some of them are not. And so it's decided to say, but what is that going to mean for you? Because I think that's what's, that is what the most unique, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful and unique things about work in the metaverse right now is, you know, there are, there are times that I've seen like in digital transformation where there was a pretty strong definition of like what digital transformation, like there are times obviously where it's been nebulous too, but like what it is, what it's not, or like, we're doing Salesforce implementation. Like there's a pretty rigorous example of what that definition is. Definition is. This is one of those times where because there's such a nebulous definition of what the metaverse is and what it's not, what technologies are included and what it's not, it's just a new way to think about transformation. And frankly, I don't really give a shit what term people put on it. Um, I happen to have a role that has been coined with the term metaverse, so that's the one I'll, I'll use. Um, but it's this idea to say, hold on, let's unpack this Lego. Kit. So I do, I do think it is important to define aspects of it though, right? Because that's yeah, how you help yeah. people understand it. So so one thing that's been coming up a lot for me, and I'm, I'm really curious to get your take on it, is that a lot of folks that aren't in the industry the way that we are or aren't building these programs the way some of our clients are, they, they just kind of hear all the news, right? They hear that surface level noise and then that's what forms their understanding of what this stuff is. Yep. And so a lot of folks have come up to me and been like, oh, but did you see what happened with FTX? Are you really sure about all this metaverse stuff? And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Those aren't the same, like, like blockchain and what's going on with the NFT world and what's going on with all these exchanges falling apart. That's not the same thing as immersive technologies and extended reality and what we're doing with with metaverse there's an overlap like there is an idea that decentralizing some of that and having tokenization and having data live on chain could make sense for these virtual worlds but it, it's yep. an overlap it's not a, a synonym right and so i'm wondering what your take is on how to explain the difference between blockchain and metaverse and what blockchain's place is when it comes to metaverse good question um good direct question that I'm going to answer incredibly indirectly. Um, if we based everything we knew about the internet right now based on the dancing baby, we wouldn't have excelled the global, you know, GDP to where it is right now. So like that's, and that's what we're doing. We are in the dancing baby version of the internet in metaverse right now. So part of me is like, gr I'm glad this stuff is happening. Now, by the way, I, I hate that. Oh my God, if your entire life savings were just completely fucked um, because some asshat 
didn't understand regulations in the financial industry, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that super duper sucks. Um, this is what happens in technologies. People try stuff and it fails miserably on the surface level. But we learned a lot about that. We learned a lot about, okay, if a decentralized non-fiat-based -fiat currency is ever going to be a part of our daily vernacular and behavior, some things need to be put in place in order for that to be successful. I don't think we would have learned that because we're a kinesthetic race. We are the human race learns by doing. <laughs> and, and you know, this is a time where, I mean, NFTs, perfect example. I'm super sorry for anyone who lost their ass with, with what happened. The fundamental idea around tokenization is strong. Tying it to pictures of monkeys, I, you know, I think that there's a large debate out there. I personally would say, hey, that is a use case, and we learned very quickly that that use case has a ceiling. <laughs> the technology is sound, though. And so one of the things that this is how I, I have a lot of friends who are like, well, you're probably not going to have that metaverse job for much longer because meta stock is plummeting. I was like, well, hey, Mark Zuckerberg's inability to talk about business um, practicality when it comes to the beautiful technologies he's building is not a reason to say that meta is failing. Like, I, people... I honestly think, I think it's so easy to bash on, on meta and Facebook. Oh, yeah. And so people do it, but, um, yeah. and look, and I, I, I don't, the, the I don't totally agree with Zuck. Which... I've got, I've got my differences with what they're doing as well. Right. Like I, I I'm not like pro meta in some huge way, but I do have an immense amount of respect. Mm -hmm. for the impact they're having on the space as a whole. Like I still use an Oculus regularly. The, 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 the money they're investing in the future of AR and setting the stage opens up so many doors for everybody else. Like it, it's one of those things where the industry's at a stage right now where like, yeah, if your competitor wins like a $3 million contract over you, that sucks. And you're not going to be happy about it, right. but you're going to be a little happy about it. You're gonna be like someone won the $3 million contract. The pie is getting bigger. More money is getting spent on this That's type the of thing stuff. Is the pie is growing and each of these people who are contributing to it. I just have great respect. Now, like, by the way, there is plenty of snake oil out there for sure. And I am loving that there are companies that have a risk profile that are willing to say, I don't know, we think this thing is going to be big. We think this is going to be transformational. The only way we're going to know is by putting something out there. And by the way, Mark Zuckerberg could not have come to his board of directors and said, I have, a th I have an idea that the technological theory of the metaverse is, is interesting and we should invest billions and billions and billions of dollars in it. They would have said, I'm not investing in a theory. He had to say, this is here now and it is the next thing. Unfortunately, that's the talk track that gets shared. And, and what, you're, what you're not seeing is, is he's just a massive trial and error guy. He's putting things out there and going, I don't know, like everything is a step forward. Like a lot of people are like, oh my God, legs on avatars, how stupid. And I'm like, well, yeah, there's no practical like outside of the novelty i get where that is on the surface level like do you understand though like the amount of technology that is going into trying to build what we do think maybe a new layer of it and by the way people are like what people think everyone's going to be walking around with headsets on like no no one thinks that well i, I think that is was... how we experience it now but like five years from now we're not going to be walking around with headsets like yeah, I, th I think if the future of the metaverse is someone wearing a VR headset at a virtual version of their desk, that's a sad future. That's not where any of us I want agree. it to go. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I think is also interesting is like, I think that Google and Samsung and like I read an article, I, I can't take credit for this, this realization. I think it was TechCrunch that, that put this out there. But um, basically, it was saying that the Samsung and Google and a few other companies tried to make these really cost effective headsets. Um, they made these like $20, $30 headsets that you could use with your phone and stuff like that. And they were not a great experience. Like they were, there was nothing in comparison to even what the, the Oculus Quest one is able to do or the right. Oculus Rift back in the day. And it, I think turned a lot of people off because all of a sudden that was the first time VR became really accessible to a lot of people, but it mm -hmm. wasn't really VR. It was this kind of really cheap shoddy version of it. And most of those people are 
going to be a little jaded about the idea of dropping 10 times that money mm-hmm. to buy a headset and try that experience mm-hmm. out again. Mm-hmm. And and so I think that for the foreseeable future, at least from what I'm seeing, I think it's going to be a very enterprise focused space um, mm-hmm. for the next three years, at least. Um, we're going to see the headsets move in that direction. We're going to see the software move in that direction. Mm-hmm. And then once AI can really ramp up how scalable it is to create 3d immersive experiences and like cut some of these costs down a little bit. And once enough has been templated and built out, then we might see a pivot back to consumers ramping up, but I don't know. What's your take on that? Yeah. Yeah. So I tell a lot of the companies because a lot of people want to do consumer based metaverse experiences right now. And my, my personal suggestion to them is a lot of this is new. We're still trying to identify what behaviors are, are, are these human behaviors, which ones are trends, which pain points truly exist. You know, you can't just go to end consumers and say, do this thing. We think it's going to unlock a value pool. Mm. You like human behavior is that if I have a problem, I will use said technology to fix it. Um, and, and, and I think there's elements there's elements of how you can engage with a consumer, right? But it's more like right. online gaming being repurposed. And I think that's okay. Like, I think a lot of people puff that it's like, oh, it's just gaming technology. I'm like, yeah, it's gaming technology. We're using it for different things now. Mm-hmm. Isn't that incredible? It's like when uh, the interview with Bill Gates on the David Letterman show, when he's talking about streaming audio online and David Letterman's like, oh, well, isn't there this thing called the radio? You can totally empathize with why he jumps there, but yeah. he doesn't understand the level of accessibility the internet provides is different than the accessibility right. that radio provides. Or Bill Gates knowing that, hey, maybe at the time a few people have the internet, eventually this is going to power the way any, everyone works and you're going to have a smart. I'm not saying that he did think this way. I have no idea, but like he was certainly right. Yeah. Everyone is walking around with a supercomputer in their pocket full with music. Like, you know, it's the same. It's... It's, it's those types of things where I, I wish, I mean, we also live in a, in a society where the ability to share one's thoughts, opinions, um, readily at any given time and the accessibility to content and things is so instant that, you know, it's like, you can't develop a lot of this stuff in not in secret, but you can't develop it internally and learn without it getting out there and getting completely, you know, bastardized by, by people's immaturity around it. And so I think that this is, it's one of those times where I, I think we learned a lot by trying to hit the consumer market first with a lot of these technologies. We have learned a ton and I hope what's happening and what I'm at least trying to do is go back to some of the drawing boards for lack of a better term and say, well, Hey, we learned this when we tried to get, when brand X, Y, and Z tried to put together an AR scavenger hunt for consumers to try to drive more traffic to the real t- retail store. Interesting brand activation idea. I don't know if you're going to say like it made you a ton of money. And so what did we learn? Let's take that back and develop it and continue to look again. Desirability <laughs> above all else. And well, Yeah. Well, and it's, it's interesting because I, I think that there is advantages to slowing down. So like you mentioned this oversaturation of content, right? Like all these ideas are so readily available. They're everywhere. And I started thinking about how I interact with a 3d experience versus a 2d experience. And like, is it just more engaging? Cause it looks cool. Is it engaging? Cause I can right. click on things. that's interactive. Like what actually makes it better. Right. And, and without a VR headset, just a 3d environment on, on a computer. And the example that came to mind for me was this um, exclusible penthouse that I have that I use in spatial. Um, I'm an advisor for exclusible. I love the the work that they do in 3D modeling and building out these really um, lifelike spaces. And I've invited some people there before and we've spent some time looking at a video in the theater and then another video on the roof. And the way people interact is really interesting. And they've collected a lot of data on this now that in a 3D environment, there's less users that jump into the environment because there's more barrier to entry. But once they're there, they stay there way longer and they sit in each room way longer than they do if they're on a website. When I go to a website, 
I'm opening like five different tabs, looking at each tab for maybe three seconds, just glancing for images or bullet points that say the information I'm looking for, and then kind of move on, right? Like a website's That's very behavior. easy to jump behavior. around. So if, if I training? imagine I'm not the only one doing that, right, oh, and, yeah, if, sure. and if you gave executives a way to like share case studies through a digital twin of an executive briefing center, where even if they're still just watching a video, but they're watching a video in a special designed 3D room that they walked into themselves and that's all they see. They don't see all these other tabs to click on. That's probably gonna be a more engaging experience. They're probably gonna retain more of the information from that case study than if they just go click a video on a website, right? Oh yeah, one of the, one of the easiest, most low hanging fruit for any company right now is around their employee experience, around knowledge transfer, recruiting, onboarding, and what the power of immersive experiences can do for that. Like the amount of data behind, I think uh, recently it was, what, a major company will spend $1,500 per person per year trying to tr train in some way. And Is Accenture al already doing some of this too? I saw they were onboarding like a couple hundred thousand people with Alt VR. Um, I know that they've done some work with AI around this stuff. Like what, what was your, on cause you onboarded relatively recently. What, what was your process like for coming into an, an organization like that? Did they use any of these kind of tools? Oh yeah. Yeah. And Accenture is a, and again, like they, they, they lead in this area by saying we're at least, if we're going to be talking to our clients about this, we better at least test it ourselves and learn about what works and what doesn't. And I mean, what is interesting is the data does show that if you spend $1,500 per person per year on training, something like 90% of that is not retained after a month. And so like, if you just think of it from like your balance sheet, that's a pretty big loss depending on the size of your company. So by the way, <laughs> the big if is if you are having a pain point around knowledge retention, hey, there are some very interesting technologies um, powered by a myriad of platforms and, and uh, applications that that can that can help with that. Um, not every company needs it. I think some do. Some will find massive benefit from it. Some will find it to be novel. And again, we're learning. And I'm excited for five years from now, looking back on this and saying, "Whoa, what was the stickiness? What was the thing?" I mean, my gosh, you, the if you remember, like the the burst of applications in the 2000s, it was like. A lot of applications came and died. A lot of them pivoted and had to find brand new business models. A lot of them um, transformed or, got, you know, and that's going to happen with Metaverse. It's going to be, there's no single solution out in the market now that I believe is going to be here five years from now. It'll be a different version. I'm not saying the brands won't exist, but like it'll be a different version of that application. And I think, and, and by the way, that's a tough sell for, for people to say, if you're, if this is going to be, transformative if you look at the timeline for digital transformation within the industry that was a long timeline with a big up ramp and like companies are still going to that's not going to be the case with metaverse it is a whether it's because the generations have changed and there's more digitally native people like working it's it's happening where there's this like hockey stick curve that's showing like it's like it's fine it's fine it's fine it's here and I think one of the things that we're doing is we are seeing a lot of the Ford, Ford focused companies to say, man, this thing is coming and it's coming fast. And yeah, I am willing to invest in trying to figure out what this means for me and what it doesn't. And there's not a one size fits all uh, solution, which makes it fun to use, like to get back to our other point. Like that's why imagination is so important in this because you're coming up with a whole new set of constraints. You're, you're uh, anyway, it's a beautiful thing. Well, even the, even the KPIs are going to have to change, right? And like like as much as like a car company wants to sell more cars, like it's not just about how many cars you sell. To your point, it's also how much money are you saving on the back end with retaining information with employees or not needing stock in person anymore for all these in-person right. showrooms or like not having to go through a dealer if you can sell it yourself virtually. Like there's so many other variables now that make this a different type of campaign to evaluate as a business when you're making the decision. But by the way, I know we're a little over. Do you have five, 10 more minutes? That's what I was actually going to, I was actually pinging you in the chat here as I didn't realize what time it was. Um, I do need a jet. Okay. Um, no worries. We'll, we'll definitely need to, to run a, sort of 
follow up or, or any of yeah, that. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be great to run a part two at some point. Oh I have gosh, a million yeah, other absolutely. questions on like the the ecosystem of the space and your thoughts on other vendors and whatnot. But um, oh, I love it. Yeah, I'm sorry. I know I'm a I'm, I'm rather verbose and I'm anything but succinct so um. all good man all good no i I mean look that's why i love the long format um is because i like getting your personality your story out there um and then also talking about the space and what's going on but before we wrap up i always like to give an opportunity if there's anything you want to plug if there's a project you're showcasing or a website or anywhere you want to send people um this is your opportunity that's kind of, that reminds me of hot ones at the very end where you're like, this camera, this camera, tell them what you're working on. Um, I am in, ah, funny you should say this, um, I am in the middle of some, I would say, career exploration. I'm not going to, I like to think it's a quarter life crisis because I plan on living until I'm 140. So Love I'll it. say I'm, in, I'm having a bit of a quarter life exploration on, um, so much of my time is spent uh, at, at work, which is a, I'm fortunate that I get to do super rad stuff for that. Um, but, you know, I am looking for some more really interesting ways to uh, let my creativity out personally. And so I'm actually this year going to be working on an album. <laughs> um, I am starting a podcast with one of my best friends called Don't Tell the Boys, which is a um, what, a, a podcast all about um, how men can be more vulnerable with one another and talk about the real hard stuff um, in a very – safe way have therapeutic conversations um because i believe there needs to be a lot more of those types of discussions and um if you're looking for guests guests for that by the way i know a guy that would be fantastic um he hosts weekly meetings um he's an actor in la and love it he's like the epitome of that of like confident male in his own body but also like very emotionally vulnerable and good at pulling that out of other people oh i love that Yes, yeah. I have a T-shirt that says uh, "Hug Your Bros," and that's going to be like one of the first. Love that rep, rep it on the show. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> but, yeah, no. So I don't know. I'm again, all of these ideas could go nowhere. But if you're asking me today, some of the personal things that I'm looking to explore this year, those are two of them off the bat. That's awesome. Yeah, and I'll keep you in the loop with other stuff too. I know this this Metaric brand is something I'm just starting to really take off with, and um, I've been it, talking with. Up. I've been talking with Nate and Nolan and a few guys about trying to set up like a VR meetup uh, where we just get industry leaders to come together and Fully eat our own that. dog food, get in the space, hang out, network, and not yeah, like a big Pro massive has been event. In there but... that needs a little bit more attention. So what's? Oh, you what's got the Quest on? Pro. Of course, you have yeah. the Quest Pro. Why am I surprised? <laughs> big, um, big kudos to the pass-through technology of the Quest Pro. It is night and day from the Quest Two. If anyone wants to try it, it's beautiful. Hell yeah. Uh, well, awesome, Tyler. Thank you so much. We'll definitely run this back soon. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and call it.